It was a cold October morning in 1973 when the two of us arrived to start the day shift at 9 a.m. The morning's maintenance schedule had been left for us the night before by the chief projectionist. After the usual morning coffee and perusal of the early morning newspapers, it was time to start. Little did we know, but events were about to change our whole perception of earthly things and that for many weeks afterwards terror would strike through to the very hearts of everyone involved directly and indirectly. The morning's maintenance involved dropping the front house lights. Those house lights were large and heavy. The only way to lower the pair was one at a time. They were housed in the theatre's ceiling seventy feet off the ground. They could only be accessed by climbing into the theatre's loft area and then by walking slowly over rafters. One slip and it was a long fall. Connected to a hand winch, the process of lowering or raising a light was no easy task because of the weight involved. It would also take 10 to 15 minutes to complete the procedure each way. Without realizing anything out of the ordinary, I agreed to meet the other projectionist inside the hall. He would in turn go into the void and drop the lights. I would make my way down to the auditorium and into the cleaner's room to obtain a bucket of warm soapy water and a sponge ready to start cleaning. I knew it would take at least 15 minutes to drop one light, so there was no hurry. It took me about a minute to reach the hall and another minute to enter the cleaner's room. I talked and laughed with the female cleaners for some time before picking up the bucket and sponge. Prior to leaving, one of the cleaners entered and said, Brian is in the foyer. You'd better get up there and see him. He's almost in tears. With curiosity ringing in my mind, I made my way there. Upon entering, Brian was sitting on the sofa surrounded by female cleaning staff. Walking up to him, I jokingly said, What's wrong? You look as though you've seen a ghost. In an instant, he bit my head off. That's not very effing funny, he said, almost in tears. He then added, I'm not going back in there alone. With a smile beaming from my face, I just had to ask why. He explained that he'd entered the void as normal, and after climbing across the rafters and beginning to undo the steel tie pins supporting the house light winch cable, he said he'd heard the sound of heavy footsteps walking along the gantry. At first, he said it didn't bother him, for he thought it was just the outside winds blowing and creaks creaking in the wood, and so he chose to ignore them. Until, that is, the sound of ghostly moans and groans scared him so much that he hightailed it out of the void in a terrified state. After hearing what he'd said, one of the cleaners suggested that I go into the void area with him, as he really did look frightened and half scared out of his wits. I agreed, and we both went up the stairs towards the projection room and void entrance. Brian would not enter the void first. I had that honour, and despite his fear of entering, he did finally come in, behind me. We made our way to the house light winches and dropped both front lights, one at each end. While I was in there with him, nothing happened. All I heard were the normal everyday creaks and outside sounds that were always there. When the chief and senior projectionists heard of this, all they could do was laugh and literally take the water out of my other half. Nonetheless, the events that were due to follow soon changed their minds, and they too started experiencing difficult situations that were just too hard to explain away. Some days later, I was back on the early shift, only this time with the senior projectionist, Bill. We'd no sooner entered the building when the cleaning staff were all over us like fleas on a cat. They were disturbed and distressed by something most of them had witnessed and heard. 
we finally got to understand that as the cleaner switched on the inner security lights, they witnessed a large bubble of colors appear and form in the auditorium. They went on to describe this event in great detail. It started out as a small ball of color that grew and grew until it was a huge array of mixed colors in a giant ball that filled half of the auditorium wall. They said it was like looking at a giant see-through kaleidoscope. As it started to disappear, it made a loud bang and was gone. That particular event never occurred again, but it sure did rattle the cleaners and their wits. Even they were now very sheepish about what was happening and did their jobs on tenterhooks, and they would only work in pairs, never alone on the job. The cinema manager was growing curious too, and as a media showman he was quick off the mark to get the local newspapers, TV and radio stations involved. After that, we had psychics of every kind crawling out of wormholes in the woodwork that came to try and discover who or what was causing the commotion. Needless to say, none of them did. It was as if they were being treated as uninvited guests by our uninvited guests and not privy to those special occasions. In the end, it was Brian and I who solved the mystery and it wasn't one ghost, it was two.